this passage of scripture refers to the Antichrist. We know that there is a person called the Antichrist. He, he is not here right now in the sense that we don't know um, who he is. He's not revealed, remember, until end times things begin to take place. As we understand the scripture, the first thing that would take place is the rapture. And after the rapture takes place, there would be a time of peace and safety. There would be a covenant that would be signed by the Antichrist, a promise perhaps to rebuild the temple in Israel. That will begin a three and a half year period called the tribulation. At the end of that three and a half year period, he will then defile the temple that somehow he has an involvement in helping to make. And when he defiles that temple, a thing will, will take place called the abomination of desolation. When that happens, that'll mark the end of that first three and a half year period and the beginning of the second called the great tribulation, which will be another three and a half years. And after that three and a half years, Jesus will come back. And when Jesus comes back, he'll set all things right. He'll defeat the armies of the world with a word and you will be with him. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we would come back with him. As the scripture describes the scene, Jesus is coming back on a white horse. You also are with him on horses. You say, I don't like horses. You'll change your mind. Right? I'm afraid of horses. I don't think you'll be afraid. You say, yeah, I like the idea. I want to wave a sword. You won't do anything. You'll just be with him. And he will win the victory all by himself because he doesn't need our help. He's God. And of course, as we understand from the scripture, all things will be folded up and changed. And so God will make all things new. And one day, of course, very soon after, we will be with him and we will be with him in glory. He'll wipe the tears from all faces. And he said, behold, I make all things new, right for these words are true and faithful. That's what we're living for. That's what we believed in him for. And one day that's what we'll die for, unless we're raptured. I prefer rapture. Who'd rather be raptured than die? There you go. Okay. The Antichrist will be a part of this whole period called the day of the Lord because the Antichrist is the one that is the opponent. He is a person who would be inspired, even possessed by Satan, and Satan will lead through him and he will dominate the world. This will happen during the tribulation and the great tribulation. The Antichrist is described in Daniel 11 as a vile person. He's described as the man of sin, the son of perdition, also known as the son of destruction, the lawless one in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He's the first beast that's mentioned in Revelation 13. But the word Antichrist is not always specifically referring to him, but also refers to what is known as the spirit of the Antichrist. That word Antichrist is used five times in the Bible. Three of the times it's used in the passage that I just read. Notice verse 18, it says, little children, it is the last hour and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. We just referred to this. Even now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. Notice verse 22 in our text. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. That idea of verse 22 isn't so much just referring to the Antichrist, the person, but rather people who adopt that same view or are influenced by the Antichrist. Turn your Bibles real quickly over to 2 John. Notice 2 John verse 7. There's only one chapter in this small book, but notice what it says here. 2 John verse 7, this is the fourth time the word Antichrist is used. 2 John verse 7, it says this, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ. In other words, many liars, many liars, people who lead others astray, many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver, meaning this, Many deceivers who do not confess that Jesus Christ came into the, in the flesh. He's laying out the point, and then he says this, to emphasize it, this type of person, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. Somebody who has the spirit of the antichrist. And there are many people in church history who were like that, especially in the early part of the church. 
from 50 AD on to about 100 AD, there were a group of people that were especially prominent, and John writes about them. The book here is spoken against these people called the Gnostics. And these people, among many other false teachings, denied the incarnation. So in other words, in some way, shape, or form, they denied the incarnation, either that Jesus did not actually come physically, that he moved about like a phantom, or that him walking around on earth was simply a man who was influenced by some type of divine force. In some way, it was minimizing what happened. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Very clearly, the Word being Jesus, we know that through many different aspects of Scripture, including Revelation 19, 11, John is speaking to the Gnostics and what he's writing. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. He was in the beginning with God because he's God. And verse 14, John 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Notice again, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He wasn't always flesh, but he was always God. So he always has been God, will always be God, and he never stopped being God. He did not exercise all his rights as God when he came down, but he was still God. And for some reason, the Gnostics had such a huge problem with this. And for some reason, this has been a popular way of thinking for many people who think they know more than they know. And so there's been many people who've adopted this type of thinking after this period of Gnosticism, even to this day. So there are religions based on this idea of denying Jesus or magnifying man, as if somehow men had a pre-existence. And so Jesus is just simply one who had a pre-existence, and then he came and progressed and ultimately became a God or began to embrace his God consciousness. That's false teaching. It's really modern day Gnosticism. Or somehow minimizing Jesus as simply being one who attained God consciousness as a God. Some like to put the word a right there in John 1.1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was a God. Not so. It's not there. Jesus has always been God. He is the God and always will be God. Amen? And so it's important that we understand that because this is one element of many and for good reason on their part why they deny that Jesus came into the flesh. And so the Gnostics, simply put, among many other things, denied the incarnation. And there are many that still believe these types of things today in various different forms. All of these things are the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, notice 1 John 4. Turn there with me, please, to 1 John 4. Notice what it says. It's important that we understand these things because sometimes there are things that might look like they're good. They might sound like they're good, but that doesn't mean it's good. You know, sometimes, of course, there, there are things that, that kind of, you know, pass the smell test or they might pass the taste test. But it doesn't mean that it's actually something that is a really good thing for you. I remember, you know, just sitting there in the house, you know, when Vicky was gone uh, recently in the summertime and, and Lily and Caleb were back with me and just thinking, well, you know, don't really want to leave the house. You know, what if we just door dash? And so we door dash some food now and again, but then we realized we can door dash crumble. Right? And so we thought, well, who knows what crumble is? It's like heaven in a box that comes to you if you pay a little bit extra. And so we would have crumble, and then I found out crumble is only 120 calories. Do you guys know that? Let me just say it again. A crumble cookie is only 120 calories. Small. What's that? Re Are you serious? I didn't know that. <laughs> that, that. That explains something. I didn't read the fine print. I thought it was just 120 calories. Kind of destroys my story, but... Instead of a weird way, it kind of makes the story better because we would get them and, of course, we'd eat them and enjoy them. Are you serious? Are you serious? Wow. That's deceptive. That's deceptive. Come on, crumble people. Right? Huh. I really didn't know that. Well, we were excited because we thought they were 120 calories. You know? And I happen to like oatmeal cookies, but they never have oatmeal cookies. 
And so I was driving up north, um, had to go meet somebody. It was a long drive. And so I had some water, just thought, yeah, oatmeal cookie. So I went by Subway and had the oatmeal cookie and small. You know, I thought, well, that's, that's good because you can have more than one. And then they actually sell them by three. So I just thought I'd get three because it seemed more prudent. And that was good stewardship. And then when I looked at them, when I looked them up, they're 200 calories each. I thought, that's, that's a lot. And I thought I might as well have just gotten a crumble cookie. But after what you guys said, the whole thing's messed up. You know? <laughs> so the point is you can think something's okay when it's not okay, which really magnifies the point because i become the learner. Um, that's the point, right? <laughs> something might seem like it's good, but it's, it's not good. And, you know, sometimes your eyes are like, boom. And sometimes you're standing at a pulpit realizing, boom. Wow. <laughs> That's the point. First John 4, 1 John 4.1, notice what it says. Beloved, do not believe every advertisement that you read. Do not believe every spirit. The idea is this. It's not just believing spirits like, yeah, I'm not in the habit of talking to spirits. You are in the habit of talking to people or reading what people have written that was inspired. Where was it inspired? Where does it come from? You need to ask yourself that. You need to, to go deep. You need to seek the Lord to understand where the thing comes from. Because everything comes from something. No one, no human being today has some original thought. It comes from somewhere. And remember what the scripture tells us, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, against hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Speaking about the things that are unseen, that are working behind the scenes. We need to be thinking. We need to be praying. We need to be discerning. And that's why it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Notice, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Now, he's specifically speaking about this because of the Gnostics. It goes on and says this, And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit or the influence, is the idea, of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. We need to test things. We need to understand if it's so. Because the truth is this. It's the spirit of the Antichrist that's our concern today. And that spirit or that influence, if you will, is working in many different ways. You see, Satan will control the Antichrist one day during that period called the tribulation and the great tribulation. But today he controls what influences the world. And the Bible tells us very clearly in 1 John 5, 19, the whole world lies under the sway or the influence, the control of the wicked one. And so we need discernment, understanding that there's forces that are invisible, but powerful, very real, that are really pulling the strings, kind of like, a puppet. And Satan truly is, and if you understand the reference, you'll get what I mean. Satan truly is the master of puppets. Always has been. And so he controls those things that we see that are controlled by something else. And so he's very deceptive and he's very good at what he does. And so when you hear people questioning things or you're wondering, where in the world does this come from? I mean, who could think of this thing? I mean, who would even like just make up the idea that somehow men could have babies? You know, I mean, and it is something that you're almost like, oh, kind of laugh about. But ultimately you realize, wait a second, there's something going on behind the scenes. Or that somehow there would be confusion about a host of issues. But just to take that one as an example, because it's something that's been propagated so much recently, shoved down your throats as if somehow you're an ignorant wretch, if you didn't know this, that men can be women or women can be men, or you might have a whole, you know, 85 different genders at any given time, or if you choose a spectrum, 
you can choose whatever you want based on your mood. And of course, everyone has to bow down and curtsy to what your whim is. Where does that come from? You say, well, they're idiots. Or they're crazy. Or they're insane. And so the name calling doesn't help. It certainly wouldn't reach them. The issue is they're deceived. It comes from something. Test the spirits. You say, well, what does that have to do with Jesus Christ coming to the flesh? Well, here's the interesting thing. It's fascinating to me that this becomes such an emphasis right now on where it comes from because Satan has always wanted to hurt God. But he can't. But what he can do is hurt you. And God cares about you, which is why God says, whoever touches you touches the apple of my eye. In other words, it'd be like somebody poking your eye. And you think if they poked your eye, you'd respond. Imagine how God feels. Because he's made every single human being on earth, and he's zealous for them. He wants every single person to come to him and have eternal life. Satan knows this. And so, of course, he goes all throughout history doing whatever he can to hurt people, knowing it ultimately hurts God. And what can he do when it comes to people? Well, he's done a lot. And what's he doing now? Well, he is messing people's minds up about who God is and how he makes things as if somehow God makes mistakes. God's never made a mistake. And he created them from the very beginning, male and female, male and female, he created them. And what does Satan do? He seeks to damage, to pervert, ultimately to destroy what God has made. Because he can't make anything, but he can certainly make a mess. And if you understand what happens in the process of of people's minds who believe these things, and what happens when they get the wicked people that would counsel them in these things, and encourage them to do it, the medications that they take and what happens to their body, and ultimately the grotesque and the brutal reshaping surgeries that some of these people go through, there would be no joke in the room. There's no laughter. There's no mocking. It's horrible. Their depression rate through the roof, their suicide rate, unbelievable. These are people God made. And God made them with the breath of life. What means they, like you and I, are the jewel of his creation. And right now, Satan has a hold of their mind and their heart. They're not our enemy. They're the prize. They're why we're here. We're here to help. Amen? We're to help them understand there's a God in heaven who loves them, always has and always will. And he wants to set them free. And he can set them free. So we need to understand what is happening and who's pulling the strings. And it is, in fact, Satan. And it is, in fact, that spirit of the Antichrist. And that spirit of the Antichrist is here now. It was here back then, 2,000 years ago. And so there are three signs we're going to go through real quickly that, that show if a person has or is being influenced by the spirit of the Antichrist. The first is right here in verse 19 through 21. It's this, first sign, they depart. Notice verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest or made known that none of them were of us. But you, so we're different, have an anointing from the Holy One. I believe this is the Holy Spirit, that God has given us his spirit who guides us in all truth. So we have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. We know all things as God directs us. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Now, I don't know what you know or how much you know. Some of you know more than others, and Someone in the room knows the most, I suppose, right? But nobody knows everything except God. God is omniscient. And there's certain things, of course, that we have to know and certain things we should know. Kind of like the old story when this lion was walking through the jungle, just feeling like he needed to kind of help everybody remember right, who he was and who the king of the jungle was. And so as he was strutting through the, the jungle, he goes up to one animal and he says, you know, who's the king of the jungle? And he roars and he oh, you are, Mr. Lion, you are, Mr. Lion goes up to another animal. Who's the king of the jungle? And he roars. The other animal goes, you are, Mr. Lion. 
you are Mr. Lion. And he goes from animal to animal until finally he approaches an elephant and he roars, Bruh! who's the king of the jungle? And the animal, the elephant turns around real quick and bumps him, right? starts thrashing him with his, with his tusk, picks him up by his trunk, right? and then slams him, bam, 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 bam. And then he sits on him, right? And then he walks away. The lion is embarrassed and, of course, defeated, bruised up, limping. And he walks away and he mumbles under his breath. You don't have to get so mad just because you don't know the right answer. <laughs> Listen, sometimes, you know, that's how, how, how people think in the church. And sometimes that's what uh, um, people who are non-believers feel. Like somehow, you know, if we don't have all the information, like I don't know the code, I don't know how to say the words, right? You're going to be after me. But I have to get everything right. As if it's just being right for right's sake. That's not the issue at all. It's not that people with the spirit of the Antichrist don't know the right answers. Because when we get saved, we don't know everything. And when we get saved, we might believe certain things that we're kind of bringing in from our life before Christ. Is that fair? It takes time to experience this thing called sanctification, but it takes time to, to grow into our faith, to understand what it means to be a Christian. And we need to be patient and gracious, and frankly, we need to be more patient and gracious with people, as if somehow, you know, they don't have the right to have a thought. That's, that's silly. It takes time for God to do that work, and praise God, people were patient with me. I'm sure they've been patient with you, but I know that we all could grow in being more patient. So again, it's, it's not that the people with the spirit of the Antichrist don't know the right answer. It's that they reject the source of answers. Listen again. They reject the source of answers. They're not going to the source. They're ignoring the elephant in the room in every conversation. And what's that elephant in the room? You say, well, it's God. No. The elephant in the room is the Bible because God has given us his word so we would understand him, so that we'd have something outside of ourselves that's tangible so we can test the spirits, so we can test all things and hold fast to that which is true. We need something outside of us that's tangible that we can see, but that thing can't be man-made. It has to be something that's God-made. Now, the Bible's not God. It's not the Father, Son, Holy Spirit in the Bible. But the Father, Son, Holy Spirit wrote it and gave it to us so that we would understand him. And so we need God's word. But those with the spirit of the Antichrist, they depart. They depart from it. They depart from the church because the church doesn't have the answers in their view. And so they depart from the church, not like just leaving a church, but they depart from the church, the capital C church, not recognizing that as it is in the scripture, the pillar and the ground of the truth. That's what it is. So the church in its best form, meaning any church in its best form, let me say this, the church in its only legitimate form preaches all that God's word says. But if a church does not preach all that God's word says, it should stop existing. That's why for me, when I hear about a church closing down or, oh, that church closed or this church closed or, oh, that church you know, kind of lived its life and then it died off. And some people, oh, that's so sad. I'm not sad. I'm sad when I hear about a person falling in sin that results in the church going down. I'm sad, of course, when I hear about people hurting each other in a church. That's sad. But it's not sad when any particular church closes because some churches should close. There's some churches that are growing today that should close. Because if we're not preaching the truth, we have no reason to exist. And when I say that, if we're not preaching the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, well, so help us God. <laughs> we should die. But if we have the truth, then we proclaim it without apology with grace, with wisdom, and with love, and with holy boldness. Amen? We need to be boldly proclaiming truth wherever we go because it's all we have. It's why we're here. If we don't have the truth, we're just a group of people hanging out. And those things don't last, and they're not that fun. But if we have the truth, then it's life-changing. 
It's eternity changing. It's something that can change our world. And so they depart from the church because they don't see it has any value because the church doesn't have anything that they would respect. Again, ignoring the elephant in the room. But they also depart specifically from the truth. Notice what it says here in verse 20. It says here in verse 20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. Speaking about the scripture. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. There's an encouragement, an exhortation, a reminder to the people that John is speaking to. You have what you need. You don't need anything else. Hold to it. So you know what is truth and so you know what is error. Those with the spirit of the Antichrist, they don't know what's true. They hold on to what is error. But notice how they hold on to it. Romans 1 tells us this, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Meaning this, the truth is evident, it's clear, but they suppress the truth in unrighteousness, which means this. That view of the Antichrist, the denial of who Jesus is, or the exaltation of themselves, humanism, or this belief that somehow there is no God, atheism, or there might not be a God, I'm not sure, agnosticism. This view comes from suppressing truth in unrighteousness. The atheist says, well, that's a convenient point because we don't agree. You say we're sinners, and that's why. Might seem convenient, but it's true, even if the only sin was pride. Exalting yourself to think you know more than you know, that's more than enough to deny God. And so those in Romans 1 suppress the truth in unrighteousness, and because of that, notice what verse 21 there says in Romans 1, they became futile in their own thoughts. So just foolish, useless, wasteful in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise They became fools. And we see that very clearly played out in many different arenas of academia. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Many people project they know more than they actually know. But when we as Christians grow, we learn the word, we need to remember knowledge puffs up. That can puff 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 us up too. Those who truly grow in knowledge in the Bible, they're like Paul who as they grow in knowledge, they refer to themselves in a way that is more and more appropriate. I'm the least of the apostles, he says. I'm the least of the saints, he says later. I'm the chiefest of sinners, he eventually gets to. The man who would say two times, I am nothing. So as we grow and we learn the word in wisdom, we begin to understand, God, I spoke as a fool, like Job said. I've heard of you with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees. I'll shut up. You go ahead and speak, which God doesn't need your permission, and he speaks for another two chapters. God knows everything. And we do well to learn the lesson of the wisest man who ever lived, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. It was written by Solomon, who said, he is God in heaven. You are here on earth. Let your words be few. And so we need to know, really, what we don't know, which we could write a book about what we don't know. In fact, they did write books about what we don't know. We don't know a lot. And so these that have the spirit of the Antichrist, they depart from the church, but they also depart from the truth. Secondly, they deny. So they're known. The sign of them is that they deny. Notice verse 22. It says, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist. The idea is they have the spirit of the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. So they deny. They deny different things, which means to contradict or to reject. And so those who hold these views, the spirit of the Antichrist, whatever that might be, diminishing God or emphasizing man, whether it's atheism, humanism, or Gnosticism, some type of marriage, the idea is this, they contradict and they reject. 
So they contradict and reject the truth. The problem is, is that they come to a place like this and they think to their head, well, if I'm going to walk in there, if I'm going to be a part of that, I have to check my brain in at the door. That's what they think. And here's the problem. Far too many Christians who share more than they know affirm that. And if we're honest, we've got to speak truth to this. Many within Christianity, many that go to church, propagate this idea of a faith that isn't biblical. That somehow we just take some blind leap of faith. We don't take a blind leap of faith. And you can't confuse faith with feeling. You don't feel your faith. Your faith is expressed. And your faith is expressed or demonstrated as it's built on fact. So there's fact in front of you. And then there's faith. And the feeling can come and go all at once. Because you can feel a lot of different things. You could go to the gym and fact, you've been consistent. Fact, you worked out well. Fact, you've rested. Fact, you've eaten right. Fact, you even have had recovery protein shakes. You've done everything correct. You've been monitored by a great person, a buddy or a trainer that comes alongside to help you. Fact, you've done the work. Faith, you believe that you can lift that weight. You can't lift, but you believe it. You feel like you're powerful. And that happens, right? When you work out, you can feel powerful. You can feel like, oh, I can do that. Or you can feel like, oh, I can, I can jump that one box. You feel it. And then reality hits. And you're not as strong. You're not as athletic as you, as you think you are. I was at the gym over here um, a couple years ago, and there was a guy that was working on his box jumps, probably my height, you know, and average height. He stands up next to this, this, this box, and he's far away, and I thought, you're not going to make it. And, and I was just working out while I was watching him, because I could see him right in front of me. And, and he did it, and he made it. And when he made it, he did what a lot of us might do when you, you're shocked you just did something. He made it, and he goes, <gasps> looks around, and nobody's looking at him, but I was looking at him. And I was still doing something, so I, my hands were occupied. So I looked over and I go, like that? <laughs> Dude, like that, like looks at me, like, thanks for noticing. I did it, okay? Listen, when we express faith, that faith we have isn't based on something you think could happen or you hope might happen. Our faith is based on one who is absolutely trustworthy one who can do anything, God, who's always here, knows everything, can do anything, and happens to be in love with you. He's for you. And so we base our faith on fact, like a train. Fact is that engine. It's the engine that's pulling the train. Faith is that first compartment. Feeling is like the caboose. It can be there or it cannot be there. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Listen, we literally hook ourselves to fact. And when we do that, we've expressed faith. It's a very different thing from what the non-believer or what the atheist thinks we're all about. We don't check our brain at the door. Fact, faith, feeling. We make every decision that way. That's why the God of the Bible says in Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us reason together. The idea is let us consider all the facts. Let us reason together, you and me. God says that. And that's something we should adopt as well. That when we're communicating with another person, we're saying, come, let us reason together. So these that have the spirit of the Antichrist, they deny who God is. Notice verse 22. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Notice verse 23. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So those with the spirit of the Antichrist deny who God is. Now, think about this for a moment. Atheism, we understand the word. We hear it many times. We know what it means. But listen, let's understand what it means. Atheism. Ah, right? Theos. Two words in Greek. So atheism literally means without God. So atheism. Agnostic is a completely different term. Ah, again, without. Gnosis. Two Greek words. So without knowledge. So in other words, I don't know. There are people who wonder. And the agnostic is a person that I would really define more like a skeptic. Whereas atheists oftentimes would be a critic, a true atheist. 
There are some atheists that might be skeptics. We need to understand who we're talking to when we're communicating to them. Not all agnostics would be somebody who would hate your faith. And listen, not all atheists would be somebody who would hate your faith. The person who has the spirit of the Antichrist is motivated and moved in the way that those in the early church were motivated. They were aggressive. They were anti-Christ and ultimately anti-Christian. And so these people deny who God is. They deny who he is, listen, because of what their name is. Gnosticism means having knowledge. That's what the, the name means. The, the way they defined it was this, that they emphasized personal spiritual knowledge above all else. Listen again, personal spiritual knowledge above all else. So their spiritual knowledge was greater than the Bible. That's the nature of Gnosticism. And there are people that still believe that type of thing today. The problem is that they deny who God is and specifically are denying the incarnation. And yet the scripture says clearly in Colossians 2, 8, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Listen, for in him that is in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's declaring the incarnation and it's literally blowing away the argument of the Gnostic. And so that's what God's word says. Those who have the spirit of the Antichrist deny who God is, but listen, they also deny what God said. Verse 24 says, Therefore let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. What is it? What's the gospel? Most would agree that it's speaking specifically about the gospel, that the gospel is the thing that they were denying. And what is the gospel? Paul declares it. He declares the gospel and he says very clearly what the gospel is. He says that Jesus, of course, who came, died and was buried, and he rose again according to the scripture. We believe upon him, we go to heaven. Simple as that. And we're saved then by grace through faith. Galatians 1 verse 6 says this, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. It goes on to say this, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And why does he say this? He's saying, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. The word means good news. And he goes on to say, which is not another, meaning this, it's another message, but it's not good news. Meaning we get to God by believing upon what Jesus did. Every other belief system is man's effort to do all the work. Well, the Gnostic denies the gospel. And so ultimately, the spirit of the Antichrist, they deny who God is and they deny what God said. It's important that we understand how simple this is because if we get how simple it is, it can capture our hearts. Kind of like my, my mother-in-law who was working in the kitchen several years ago, probably seven, eight years ago. She's working in the kitchen. I don't remember if she was cooking or cleaning, but she was, she was musing. She's one of the first people that I ever met who knew the Lord. And so she's walked with God for a long time. And she's just kind of musing as she's cleaning or cooking and she's singing a worship song. She says, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I'm thinking, you know, there's just something about that name. You guys know the song? Master, maker, you know, so forth. Nope, that's not what she was singing. She goes, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And she's smiling and she says, without you, we would all go to hell. <laughs> Now, that might not sell as a worship song, but it's great doctrine, you know? So those who have the spirit of the Antichrist, they depart, they deny, and listen. Lastly, they deceive. Verse 25 says, and this is the promise that he promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has, has taught you, you will abide in him. The idea is this. 
Those who deceive, the word means to lead astray, have rejected God's word. Those who deceive, of course, that spirit of the Antichrist, they depart, they deny, and they deceive. They deceive those who aren't saved, and they keep them in a place where they are without hope and without help. But listen, they try to deceive those who don't abide. And they are successful. And we need to remember that, which is why John writes these words. You see, Philip Keller wrote a book called The Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23. And in the book, he talks about the nature of a shepherd working with sheep. And at one point, as he's discussing um, this beautiful relationship, he talks about how he had proclaimed, of course, what the word says, that the sheep will not follow another, they'll follow the shepherd. And the shepherd, of course, knows them by name, and the sheep knows the shepherd's voice. And so as he was talking to a shepherd in the Middle East, the shepherd said to him, that's not true. And we know the word is true, but what did Jesus mean, I guess, is the question. The shepherd who didn't know the word said, that's not true. In real life, there is one time that sheep will follow other people besides their shepherd. And Philip Keller asked, when? And the more experienced shepherd says, when they're hungry. When they're hungry, they'll follow anyone. And that's why we need to know the word of God. Because if we know the word of God, then we would be those sheep that Jesus is referring to because he says, I am the good shepherd. He cares for the sheep. He nourishes the sheep. He protects the sheep. He heals the sheep. He guides the sheep. And he knows the sheep by name. And those sheep that are his, they know his voice and they'll follow him and only him wherever he goes, just like Jesus said. But what it means is we have to abide. It means to dwell. It means to remain. It means to live. We have to abide with him. And if we abide in him, our joy will be full and we're protected because though the spirit of the Antichrist is here, the Bible makes it very clear, greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. Amen? So, would you stand with me?